So every year I come up with a new speech title, and this year is By the Numbers. So let's talk about By the Numbers, and here we go. You should do the same. Who agrees? Yes. You will hate one of them. Your pick. <laughs> I don't care. And by the way, if you didn't vote, you can't say a word right now. Who agrees with me on this one? Yes. It's time to vote. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my red, white, and blue tie in protest of the NFL. Who agrees with me on this one, too? <laughs> Have not watched an NFL game this season. Who else agrees with me? Dude? We know our veterans a lot more than us. So let's. I'm going to talk about hurricanes. Y'all in Ohio, you think that doesn't count? I can remember when Hurricane Ike hit uh, Houston, and I was up here like a week later, and Hurricane Ike came through here. Who remembers the flooding that it caused? A few hands go up out here. But let's talk about hurricanes. So let's go on this one. say about Cleveland good is that they don't live in Detroit. <laughs> well, you know I'm right on that one. So let's, let's talk about this thing. I figured out uh, my house in Houston is not my house. It's my friend's house. My house in Houston we got 38 inches of rain in 52 hours. Do y'all realize how that that is? I mean 38 inches of rain is like right here. Am I correct? In 52 hours except some places drain into it and some places drain off of it. So one of my friends sent in his picture, he said, Ted, they use this in your speeches and show them how bad the water was. And there's no water in this picture. That's his wife's SUV. That when they were rescued at 3 o'clock in the morning by a twin engine boat, it dropped the prop on the top of his wife's SUV. Yeah. There y'all get to see the twin, yeah, you can see this one. I was asked by a national news team to do a commentary on the impact on real estate and the economy. And the woman, oh, I know we have a reporter over here, and she's actually been really good to me. Where's my reporter at? Where's she at? Where's she at? You've always been very honest and very factual in quotes. Most reporters are. Who agrees with me on this one? <laughs> they will take whatever you say and put their story on it. That's not true here, and I promise you all for that. So this reporter on Tuesday, the hurricane sent me of the flooding. 
sent me a list of questions and said, can you comment about this on national TV? And I said, yeah, I'll be there at 4 o'clock. I'm there at 4 o'clock. And the first question she asked wasn't part of the questions. She pops up this picture. She says, Dr. Jones, tell us about the value and impact on this property. And I'm thinking not very nice. That's not part of the questions. I didn't prepare for this. If you want to play this game, I can play this game. And so I said to her, this property is not as valuable today as it was a week ago. <laughs> you think something's a brilliant answer besides me. <laughs> and she says, gotcha. And then she went back to questions. And oh, by the way, in Houston, Texas, According to one of the subdivision studies by a guy by the name of Tom Crawford, the second that water comes over the threshold is permanent 22% reduction in property values. It's not true here in every other place. This is my CFO's house. Have y'all ever seen a kayak in, a, in your living room? Oh, you don't need a living room. You just need it for the 10 feet of water outside the street. Guys, hurricanes. This is the carpool way in Houston, Texas. Get a carpool. It's funnier than that. Come on out. <laughs> So the reason I'm talking about this is because I told you up front, I think we're going to have the best economic year we may have ever had. And part of it is that disasters spur economic development. Now think about this. We just had all the fires in California. We had all the fires this past summer in Washington, and Oregon, and Montana, Wyoming. We just had the hurricanes in Houston and in Florida. We shut down Florida for two weeks, guys. Oh. You say, well, that's not good, Ted. It's not good at all, except what happens after you have a hurricane or any other disaster. You get billions, tens, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars of federal money and insurance money to come into play. They say in Houston, Texas alone, for example, that we're from the day of the Hurricane Harvey until the 1st of March this year, yeah, it's not that many months, we're going to rent out 2 million more room nights in that period. And those people are from some of them for your area. And they're insurance adjusters, they're displaced homeowners, and they're, oh, they're new construction people. That's why my, who are my builders are in? You guys have an issue with labor, correct? How many, did any builder in this room lose people that went to Houston because they paid more? It happens all over the country when I ask that same question. So now let's talk about the infamous one. And I wrote a white paper about this. Let's talk about, you're actually videotaping this crap? <laughs> Like, who cares? Twitter. Twitter. Oh, tweet, tweet frequently, tweet often. Hashtag DRTCJ. Y'all know that, right? So let's get it out. You go for it, DRTCJ. So let's talk about the hurricane. The damage wasn't from the hurricane. That's Katrina. What happened in New Orleans? Well, what happens after any major event is you get a massive drop in home sales, <laughs> get a massive drop in jobs, and then it comes back, except in New Orleans. And the issue with New Orleans was, uh, it wasn't the damage to the hurricane that happened. It was a week later when their levee system failed and their pumping system failed. Remember, part of New Orleans is 32 feet below sea level, and they still have not recovered all the jobs they lost. Kind of a trade. But let's talk where, and, and the reason I'm talking about this is the national economy. Let's talk why I think it's going to boom this year. Let's talk what happens in a typical hurricane. And I'll just take you down to southwest Florida. Punta Gorda, Cape Coral, Fort Myers. This is Punta Gorda. You see the hurricane come in, you see this big drop in employment, and all of a sudden, four months later, you have more jobs than any time in history, and then it booms. And that's going to happen in California, and Washington, and Oregon, and Wyoming, and Montana, and Texas, and Florida. Think about what I just said. Remember, 50% of all title insurance premiums come from four states, California, Texas, Florida, and New York. That's three out of four states. That's why I think it's going to move. You want to look what happened? Oh, this is job growth. And by the way, y'all know that y'all get a copy of this PDF, right? Always make it available. So one guy took a picture here, and that's it. I don't know. But let's see what happened to housing sales. Who do my realtors are in? Realtors, raise your hands. I'm a realtor, too. Guys, think about this. Go down to Cape Coral, Fort Myers. The 12 months following Hurricane Charlie, housing sales. And Fort Myers Cape Coral went up 11.1%, and yes, they went up 6.3%. Historically, what happens is housing sales go up, and what happens is on that one, a lot of people say, I'm never staying here again. They weren't hurt at all, they just had enough. Who's ever had enough? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Well, that's what happens, and all of a sudden, you realtors get a listing. And by the way, realtors, who in here needs a listing, realtors? Anybody? <laughs> 
And by the way, who wants to sell our house right now and make you famous in this room? <laughs> and that's true, pretty much true because there's no inventory available. And, and, and the, so we, you know, we get all this stuff that takes place. Jobs are everything. In the U.S., and I'm going to give you bad numbers and good numbers. I'm going to tell you the truth about it. Uh, okay, good news, bad news. U.S. job growth is 1.41 percent. I think two and a half percent is really good. Except I'm going to tell you this is really good, and I'm going to show you why in a few minutes because we're talking about buying the numbers. Oh, remember my blood pressure test? My blood pressure test. Every time you go to your doc, it's the first thing they do is take your blood pressure to figure out how your health is doing. My blood pressure test in the U.S. economy is employment, leisure, and hospitality. Because you and I don't spend money on leisure and hospitality unless we feel good about the future. I actually think leisure and hospitality employment gains or losses are the number one indicator of consumer confidence. U.S. job growth overall is 1.41%. Leisure and hospitality is 1.94%. As long as we're growing more in leisure and hospitality, we're not going to a recession. Period. Uh, this morning, once again, I heard on one of the news channels that President Trump's putting us into a recession. Not true. In fact, <laughs> one of the people from the International Monetary Fund yesterday at Davos, how many of y'all read my tweets? Anybody? I got four people over here from Stuart, not one of them raised their hands. Did you notice that? <laughs> what the hell am I, Rodney Dangerfield of the Commons paper? Yeah, I'm wearing the crap. Yes! Davos, they said that they just up the world GDP estimate to 3.9%, of which 2.2% of that gain is from the income corporate tax cut in the United States. Understand the implications we have in the world. Can we write once again on this stuff? Guys, we're sitting here doing well. Now, uh, I know you guys can't read this because uh, you can. <laughs> First of all, you're young and you're close. Uh, you can't, because you're old. And, you know, <laughs> guys, look where our job growth was. We created 195,000 net new jobs last year in manufacturing. It's all about cheap energy. We'll talk about that. Trade, transportation. I mean, just look at these numbers when you get the stuff. You know, the bad news, we created 2.1 million, 2.05 million, but not rounded off, but 2.1 million jobs in the last 12 months. We created 3.2 million jobs as of February 2015, the prior 12 months. So we're way below average, and I'm sitting here telling you how good these numbers are. Ooh, we're going to do a bunch of Mythbusters. Who loved the TV show Mythbusters besides me? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Coolest TV show that I don't like to deal with, but I had to say it. I've heard there's been no job gain increase on, uh, on payroll. Just hourly average earnings in the U.S. are up 2.5% in the last 12 months. Oh, oh, and remember this 2.5% inflation, I think it's 2%. So we actually have, as an average, most of us have more money in our pockets. So I'm going to pick on the ladies now. What do you do when you have more money in your pockets? Buy shoes. Oh, buy shoes. I like that one. <laughs> well, that's not a shoe person, but I, I love her. Who remembers the comedian Gallagher with the sledge of yeah. You know, smash watermelons. Gallagher always said when his wife says buy, buy, she means that B-U-Y, B-U-Y, she's going to buy stuff, which is over half the U.S. economy of buying stuff. And, and by the way, men, you're just as guilty about buying stuff. We just buy different stuff. We buy, we, we don't buy shoes. We buy golf clubs and everything else. Am I correct, man? You want to talk about uh, where it's hot and where it's not. Now I'm going to give you bad news. Where is it hot? Nevada, number one job growth place in the last 12 months. Oregon, Utah, Texas, Florida, South Carolina, Washington, Idaho. California, Colorado, Georgia. Ooh, you're in the bottom third. Good news is you're above the half mark of bottom third. Ooh, I will also point out who has legalized marijuana? Nevada, Oregon, Florida, <laughs> Washington, Idaho, California. Y'all get this stuff yet? And by the way, I've never smoked pot. I have no problems with beer. Why would I smoke pot? <laughs> Who's losing? Alaska. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh. Alaska's in serious trouble, guys. Tax Foundation each year, and you gotta love this one. They do a study, and they rank all 50 states based on the, and I love this, which you even address this, about is it good to do business here? The answer is no way to hell. Because you're 45th best out of 50 states on corporate income tax, personal income tax, retail sales tax, unemployment tax, property tax, and yet you're growing really good here. 
Think about what I just said. Good news is it's five states worse than you. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Amazon. It's kind of like you set me up for all this stuff. And we, should, we didn't share anything, but we should have because we're like, number two headquarters, uh, second headquarters, final. Let's we'll just take a look. You're included in that list. What does Amazon want? Yeah, it's going to be awesome. To make the top 20 list. By the way, places that aren't going to happen, Chicago. Not going to happen. Uh, Los Angeles. Not going to happen. Montgomery County, Maryland. Who cares? <laughs> uh, New York City. You can't get enough real estate for that. It's so expensive to do business there. Or Virginia. Pittsburgh. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Toronto. DC is not going to happen. And so I think you guys have some good odds. But here's, here's basically what Amazon's specs were. They said we want an international airport. You got it. They said, you want concessions, did you get it? Concessions, did you get it? Concessions. This is what's that three times me there. That's when you may fall short. And, and by the way, even the people in Seattle said, if they'd known in hindsight, we could have built this, we'd get massive concessions. Am I correct? Yeah. They want housing. Uh, realtors, you got listings? No. They want mass transit. You got a bus. <laughs> I'm a stock there. They want office space. You got some, but you don't have the almost a couple million square feet. And you got the population requirement. So part of it you there. What's your odds on this thing? Yeah, I'll give you about 10%. But that's pretty positive. Who agrees with me on this one? And if it happens here, it'll be massive. And one of the neat things is what you're the second largest city in the Midwest, the largest city in Chicago. So I think you have good odds on that. If you think about it, half the U.S. population is a day drive from here. Country. Let me give you why well, I think the 1.41% job growth rate in the U.S. is good right now. In fact, I think it's great right now. 220,000. Who tweets a thing thus far yet? Anybody? Martin, you don't even raise your hand, do you? 220,000 is one of our tweets this past week. This is why I think 1.41% job growth is really good, but I think 2.5% is great. First time applicants for, for unemployment benefits, the week ending January 13th was 220,000. That's the fewest people applying for unemployment benefits in a week in the last 45 years. That's a phenomenal. Think about how many more people we had 44 years ago, how fewer people we had 44 years ago. We only had 220,000, by the way, we're up a little bit today, but not much. 1.89 million. That's the total number of people on unemployment benefits. The weekend in October 14, 2017. That's the fewest people in 44 years we've had on unemployment benefits. Gosh, y'all get it yet? Everyone that wants a job has one that has a marketable skill set. It's pretty much it. Minus one point, let's round it off, minus 1.1 million. Okay, I don't care who you voted for, but when President Obama came in with Obamacare, and they said uh, you have to provide health benefits if you have more than 50 employees, unless you cut them back to 30 hours, we had 7 million more people put on 30 hours instead of 40 hours. We had 7 million people lose full-time jobs and all their benefits. In the latest 12 months, we had 1.1 million of those people get a full-time job. Y'all get this yet? And they, well, I remember that's benefits too. This is from a week ago, USA Today. How many of y'all read USA Today? Who has an iPad in here? There's an app called USA Today. You can read it free every morning. It's one of my first reads every morning. And I like it because it's not left, it's not right. It's kind of like, this is what it is. Him, and by the way, the headline and the stuff on the lower left is all directly cut and paste from there. And they say, paycheck bumps are coming. Now, I heard from the Democrats that only the top 1% get a pay raise. I heard from Republicans, everyone wins. Y'all heard both those, right? What USA Today, it was a Motley Fool article, they said 90% of workers should see an increase in their take-home pay when the new guidelines come out from the IRS on withholding. 90%. 
What they say about bye bye earlier, y'all get this stuff. Columbus, Ohio, 1.39% job growth. The U.S. is 1.41%. I call that a statistical area. You're the same. For y'all, that's good because you live in a very tough state to get jobs. Who agrees with me on that one? I just said that. Yep. You created 15,000 net new jobs. You essentially have more jobs than the entire industry. That's great news. I just want to show you where it's great and where it sucks in Ohio. I mean, look at all the minuses. I mean, Kenton minus, uh, Mansfield minus, Toledo minus, uh, Wharton Steubenville minus, Youngstown Warren minus. Here at 1.39% Dayton. Ooh. Anyone here do business in Dayton? Our parks and what have you, we're doing pretty well on that thing. Almost 2.8%. Uh, Oh, now let's dis destroy some myths. I love this. Kenny, okay, we're going to go back here. Think on Malaya is we're going to talk the same thing. 13.6%. That's the percent of the U.S. population that age between 25 and 34. Realtors, take notes here. Okay? 30%. That's the percent of home buyers last year, late, latest 12 months, that were aged 25 to 34. 13.6% of the population bought 30% of the houses. Wow. I've heard these myths that millennials won't buy houses, they don't want to work hard, they don't care about income. Uh, 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 careful. Millennials, millennials in this room, raise your hands. Look at this, look at this. We need twice as many of y'all here next year. Who agrees? Yeah. The reason is you're a future. You're the biggest economic growth unit the United States has ever seen. And NAR says starting in 2016, you were the largest home buyer segment demographic in the country. Get a lot of this one. There was this poll from 9Gag. Does anyone in here say yes? Are you a subscriber to 9Gag? It's, I didn't think so. It's a millennial network. It has online uh, chat rooms, pictures, gaming, all this kind of stuff. They surveyed 130,000. Now, let me just source some of this about millennials. We didn't think they were going to earn much, what have you. We want to take risks. They asked 130,000 plus of these millennials, would you rather work for someone and have an easy job or you rather work for yourself and work incredibly hard? Which is kind of like my realtors because most of them are independent contractors, right, Sam? Yeah. 53% said I want to work incredibly hard for myself. That's intriguing, isn't it? I like this millennial over here giving me the bobblehead. You are a millennial, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, a couple of y'all. Ah, so all of a sudden I'm going to break this myth. Over half my millennials want to work really hard for themselves which is kind of a treat. Love this one. Would you rather commit to a guaranteed job for the next three years or would you rather commit to a startup opportunity, which means you could live or die? But lo and behold, 71%, I'll take the risks. I want to play the game. These are risk takers. They want to make money. They're willing to risk it. Love it. Would you rather gain 10 friends in real life or gain 10,000 friends on Instagram and Twitter? 95% said they want to gain 10 real friends in real life. I was in Cleveland in the first week of January as a reason. One of the people said, that's because they don't have any friends. That's not true. It's not true at all. Am I correct, millennials over here? Yeah. Well, my youngest daughter's a widow. My oldest daughter's a Gen X. But there is a difference. How many of y'all have a millennial and Gen X in your house? And then they don't live home anymore. I mean, they don't have their own jobs, what have you. Um, I attribute that to Apple because my youngest daughter had Apple computers in the classroom, my oldest daughter didn't. Whether it's good or bad, it's just a technology play. They learned how to use the technology that I like when I'm president of a relative association to the model right on this one too. Guys, it's incredible what our millennials are doing with technology. And Stan, you, or Kenny, you even said this. It's all about technology, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you on this one. Now, here's where we depart, me anyway, from millennials. They asked me, would you rather lose your right to vote or lose your right to say anything on social media? 33% of millennials said, I'm going to lose my right to vote. I'm thinking, what the hell? If you have the right to vote, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> oh, and here's where y'all really lost me, and I don't get this one. Would you rather give up sex or give up the internet? 43%. <laughs> I don't get you guys in this one. You may be one of that. You have successful home sales. Uh, oh, the neat thing is that Black Lives on top of this latest 12 months. We sold more homes than any time in history in the latest 12 months. 
in the U.S. Ex until any time in history, and since June 2006. And I'll talk to my lenders about it. In June 2006, we gave over 60% of all home buyers subprime loans. The qualifying requirement for subprime loan was a pulse rate. Am I correct? We're sitting here with the best home sale here and I have seen since June 2006 on the most stringent lending conditions you and I have ever seen. Y'all get this shit? I'm going to tell you how strong this housing market is. On oh, the blue behind is, is prices. Now I'll talk to my realtors here. This year we sold more homes than any time in history. How about that in Columbus, Ohio? I actually had, last night, I was walking in, I had a realtor ask me, when are home sales are going to improve? So where the hell have you been? <laughs> now, guys, look at this. In the recent years, home sales in the latest 12 months, I mean, you kind of see it tracking down. You don't need listings, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. 6.7%. That's your 12-month boom, your average median price increase. You're actually about 20% ahead of the U.S., Stan. It's incredible. Oh, and it's not a bubble. It's all about jobs and demand and incomes. You agree with me on that, don't you, Stan? Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of intriguing. This is total housing sales. And again, this is from y'all. Thank you very much for these data. Yeah, you can see the blue bars. We're selling more than any time in history. We look at the average number per month of prior 12 months. Great. If you want to look, oh, oh. Now, uh, we did have a tax law change. It's called the Tax Cut and Job Creation Act of 2017. And NAR came out against it dramatically. NAR spent 32 million bucks just on lobbying efforts. NAR lost. Now, I'm a realtor, so I get to say this. Or Judd, the uh, chief economist realtor, said if it, if, if it passed, we would see home values go down between minus 5 and minus 21 percent. He lied. Home values are not going to go down. Ooh, they might in California, not here. What I did is I pulled up a study, and, and, and uh, six tenths of one percent of your homes in Ohio are priced above a million bucks. So let's just do this real quick, realtors. If you can deduct now up to 750,000 mortgages, oh, oh, and for those of y'all that already have mortgages on your primary or secondary dwelling, you get to grandfather that in. Y'all do that, right? You don't get cut. How many of y'all didn't know that? Raise your hands, honestly. Yeah, if you have up to a million dollar loan right now in your primary secondary dwelling, you still get to deduct that. One of the guys, I told you I'm a bad Baptist. Uh, I go to Houston's First Baptist Church. One of the guys in my Sunday school class is done with, you may have heard of him, Ted Cruz, who's right here, Ted Cruz. And they were saying that uh, we would kick people out of their houses if we lost the ability to deduct up to a million bucks. He said, what do I do? I said, just let them deduct it up to a million bucks and already have a loan. Like new people adhere to it. I'm intrigued. But if you can deduct it to $750,000 of loans, you put 20% down, that's $937,500 worth of house. It's not an issue. Who agrees with me? It's not an issue. Uh, my builders, are you building? Build more, build often, build frequently. Am I correct, builders? No, I like this bubble head on my builder table here. <laughs> Yes. We had 8,952 joint progressive apartments to mansions, everything in between. 15,000 new jobs. You have 1.68 new dwelling units, new jobs per new dwelling unit. You think you only need one and a quarter to one and a half. You're under building. Who agrees? It's great news. Builders, am I correct? You're supposed to say, yoo hoo! Mm -hmm. Who wants to say, yoo hoo! You guys are so tight, you don't have to do that, do you? We need to go to Texas, case right Many things in this year, more jobs any time in history, tax reforms, mortgage introduction of salt. Salt will hurt some people. State and local tax deduction. Oh, so why did we, in the tax law changes, we, the states, the, the country, no longer allow you to deduct your state income tax from your federal income tax? Oh, this is a little principle called equalization. Let me go to extremes. Now, a person in California that in 2016 made a million bucks, and a person in Florida that made a million bucks, each end of the country. And last year, in 2017, they each made two million bucks. So why would I allow the tax deduction on the person in California to reduce their federal income taxes? Oh. So the person in Florida, on their extra million bucks, is to pay $396,000 
the federal income tax on the last million bucks. The person in California is going to pay 135,000 in state income tax, but because they're going to reduce by 39.6% or 39.7%, they're going to, they're going to pay $51,000 less in federal income tax. Is it fair that a person in California making two million pays less in federal income tax than a person in Florida? Yes or no? No. no. It's called principle of equalization. It's been held, upheld by the Supreme Court. Kind of intriguing. Entry level home buyers are coming back strong. Y'all win from that. My builders, builders, who in this room are building entry level housing? Because your rate cost is too high, am I correct? Kind of, kind of right there. Interest rates are going to rise. I'll show you how much later. Commercial people, raise your hands. I'm not worried about the decline in commercial sales. We're kind of in this cycle. No way it plunged. 07 it peaked. We're kind of through it. Who kind of agrees with this? This is a natural occurrence. I actually think we have the best economic economy potential we've ever seen in my lifetime. Now, part of that from the U.S., uh, go back. And in, in, in 08, we spent 13.2% of every take home dollar on average for three loans car loans, college loans, house loans. Days less than 10 cents. Talk about retail. One of my favorite, and you're going to think retail's crazy. One of my favorite pieces of commercial real estate, I own some of that, I own a retail strip center in Houston, is retail. Now, if, if in retail it says shopping center, you're in trouble. Who agrees with me? Everything else is good. Why? Because we've got more people having more money in their pocket today, buying more than they ever bought. Look at this retail sales. If we call it real. That means it's just for inflation. It's also seasonally adjusted, so we can compare December when we sell a bunch, January when we don't sell much. We're selling the most retail in any time in history, and I expect that to go on for at least a decade. I'm just telling you that right now. It's kind of intriguing. Lightweight vehicle sales. Now y'all come into play here because you're a car plant here. And you have a lot of car parts manufacturers that export stuff out of here to other states. Car part manufacturing is big. And eh, good news, bad news, we didn't sell as many cars last year, we don't think. But we sold record number of cars in 2015 and 2016. Oh, and until Hurricane Irby, uh, Irma and Hurricane Harvey, we literally saw used car sales going down dramatically. In fact, a used car SUV three years old a year ago was worth 800 bucks less than it was a year earlier. And all of a sudden, we get this big boom. See it on the end? Thank God we destroyed almost a million vehicles because of Hurricane Harvey and Irma. Y'all get this yet? Yeah. Federal debt. Now, I don't care who you voted for once again, but President Obama did double the federal debt. 10.2 trillion to 20 trillion in eight years. Do we have too much federal debt? Yes or no? Yes. I didn't hear a no out there anyway. I'll do the no thing real quick. You can never have too much debt. You can just have too little money to make the payment on the debt. <laughs> oh, by the way, for you Democrats in the room, I'm neither Republican nor Democrat. <laughs> and I heard all of the Democrats we were going to do the tax cut change. Because we're going to produce, according to the Congressional Budget Office, we're going to produce 1.4 million increase. 1.4 trillion increase in federal debt over the next 10 years. Well, by the way, that assumes no new jobs, no increase in income. Y'all understand this? Which I think we're already seeing some of that. Who agrees with that? Oh, and they're saying we can't add in the next 10 years 1.4 trillion jet. Where the hell were you Democrats when we added 10 trillion in eight years? Who agrees with me on this one? Yeah. By the way, hypocrites on both sides of the aisle. Rogers told you this is going to be your bottom, it was going to be better off. That's not true because many of y'all, 10% of y'all will pay more federal income taxes this coming year. I'll tell you that up front. And it's not bad news we have more debt. The bad news is federal debt interest payments in March last year, and that's a good benchmark because it's kind of like, if you think about it, we start the fiscal year October, November, December, January, February, March. It's halfway through the year. Our interest payments on the federal debt were up 30% compared to a year ago at the same month. Wow. Interest rates haven't gone up much. Am I correct, lenders? Wait till they go up. We can't pay our interest on the debt, guys. That's why you have this debt ceiling issue going on right now. Kind of intriguing. Um, you know, I'll go back to my commercial people. 
U.S., this is total commercial sales in the prior 12 months, so each one of those is the prior 12 months. U.S. commercial real estate sales last year went down 13.9% from 2016. Y'all's went up 20.1%. Why? Because it's a great place to do business in our primary cities, Chicago, New York, Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, are way too expensive. You have higher cap rates here, which means you pay less for it. Who are my commercial people in here that saw a lot of people from out of town last year thinking this is cheap? Look at the hands going up across here, guys. Look at the hands going up across here. Um, you want to look at the fourth quarter of last year compared to fourth quarter 2017 versus fourth quarter 2016. <coughs> U.S. sales are down, uh, commercial real estate down 38%. Here, you're down less than 4%. That's because all the people decided you're cheap <laughs> and you have economic growth and potential. Who agrees? I actually do agree with this. Great place to buy commercial real estate. 19 days. Who remembers this from last year? Anybody? What the hell did I do here last year? <laughs> I talked about 19 days last year. This is the most important words about the U.S. economy in the next 30 years. 19 days. And for Columbus, Ohio. By the way, it sucks if you live in Houston. Okay, let me put this into play. One of my best friends, uh, not best friends, good friend, you still a lot of praise work for him, is a person by the name of George Mitchell. Who, who ever knew George Mitchell? Who's ever been in the woodlands? He developed it. Shulman engineer, graduated from Texas AM, died three years ago at the age of 96. He also owned Mitchell Energy. He was the guy who perfected hydraulic fracking and shell formations. Guys, just, just three years ago, it took, 90, it took 40 days to drill and frack 9 to 12 wells at a site. Go down to 20,000 feet, draw out horizontally at a mile, a mile and a half, and we can do that in 19 days now. We just reduced the cost and the time to, to drill oil by less than half. We don't have to have 120 bucks a barrel to get out there and drill. Cheap energy is your future. You don't have manufacturing without cheap energy. I told you a story years ago. I told you every year I'm here, I'm afraid. Back when I graduated from high school in 1972, I ordered, by the way, for $3,100, a brand new Pontiac Grand Prix from the factory. Who remembers the 72 Pontiac Grand Prix? Had a hood from here to the back of that wall. Back there. <laughs> 400 horsepower, 400 cubic inches, that car could pass anything except the gas station. <laughs> and then 1973 comes in and OPEC cuts back production and it's just not the oil prices and the gasoline prices shot up, it's the fact that you couldn't buy it. Those of y'all that are young in here, back in those days, we had a, if your license plate ended in even numbers, you could only gas up on even days, if it ended odd numbers, you could only gas up on odd days. And very often when it was your day to gas up, they were out of gas. I actually think we always blamed manufacturing leaving the country on labor unions. That was part of it, but I think it was as much we couldn't guarantee any energy. That's just the opposite today. A year ago, October, uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia announced they're going to cut back oil production 1.1 million barrels per day in the next 90 days, and they did. And, and all that did to the U.S. oil producers is we started drilling more, drill often, drill everywhere, drill everything you can drill, and within literally 120 days, we increased U.S. oil production 1.1 million barrels per day. We completely replaced them. Y'all get this? All of a sudden, it's cheap to do business here, and we can ensure ourselves of construction because it's cheap energy. And I expect now we can see it blow up to 120 bucks, but we can do 200 bucks a barrel. It'll be short-lived because we're going to drill every place. I just want to show you this. Number of drilling rigs operating in North America. We used to, October 2015, we had 2,100 drilling rigs producing 9.8 billion barrels per day. Today we have 900 drilling rigs producing 9.8 million barrels per day. Less, less than 50%, in other words, 47 percent, we're producing as much oil and gas as we did with literally more than twice the amount of people and capital to do it, which says to me manufacturing grows. And remember, I added earlier, we just increased our manufacturing job growth by 195,000 last 12 months. Kind of a treat. Cheap energy rules is the future of Ohio. 
Can you agree with that? It is. Because it's just not, oh, by the way, this is just not sheep manufacturing. We're not making widgets. We're making stuff that's high value added. All of a sudden, we're going to cast the iron blocks for Caterpillar offshore. We're going to make the computer controlled fuel delivery units here. And that's the difference. So I'm, I'm really up on this one. The pink, purple, and orange is where we have oil shell or gas shell or both that we can drill today. I want to take you out to the Permian, Texas region. It's in West Texas. Oh, that's where Midland Odessa is. We used to call it the armpit of Texas. Who's ever been there? We used to call it Midland Slow Death if you lived there, because we thought they were out of oil. A year ago, a little over a year ago, they discovered there's 20 billion barrels of recover oil using today's technology just in that region. We just shipped a million barrel tanker out of Houston. A million barrels of oil to Poland. They used to buy all the oil from Russia. It's in route right now. They're going to be running on U.S. oil. Is that kind of cool? I think it's amazing because we, all these people, we have, we have more oil than we need, guys. 60 bucks a barrel oil, I think we're going to average this year. So let's look at this thing. Let's summarize it. I think we have an incredibly strong economic potential. And by the way, good or bad, I don't care what you think, I don't care who you voted for, it's because of corporate tax cuts. Now let me put that in perspective. I work for Stuart Tyler. Our holding company, Stuart Information Services Corporation, is trading the New York Stock Exchange. But Dave Martin, Mark, 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 Mark and I have actually been on the floor of the exchange and what have you, had a great time there. We've got great pictures. If y'all want to see them, yeah, yeah. Like you want to see us on the floor of the exchange. But, but in 2016, our corporate tax rate was 39% at Stewart. <laughs> if we could cut our corporate tax rate to 29%, we just doubled our net cash flow. Do y'all get it? And if you think, well, that doesn't impact me, how many of y'all have a 401k? You have stock in that 401k, which means your stock just went up in value dramatically even if you don't own Stuart because you're getting that much more cash on guys. Mortgage interest deduction is going to hurt some states. It's not going to hurt yours. Who agrees with me on this one? 750000 bucks is no deal here. It's not a deal at all. State tax deductions, which we call salt state and local taxes, it will hurt some states dramatically, such as California and New York and New Jersey. One of the studies that I tweeted about um, right after the, the, uh, the, the corporate tax cut rate and the tax, pack, tax act was passed stated that at least 5% of the people will move out of California. They might come here. You're going to have some really nerdy people here. You do understand that? <laughs> Inflation, quantitative easing. Federal Reserve, in the downturn, we had to make sure we had all this liquidity. Who are my bankers? Are there bankers? We went to all the banks. We said, we're going to buy your treasury and all this cash. You guys are so rich in liquidity that you kept interest rates really low. Well, the Federal Reserve said, we're going to reverse that. We're going to buy banks back. We call it uh, reversing quantitative easing. And all of a sudden, we're going to take this cash back and sell your treasuries back, which means there's going to be less liquidity out there, which means it's going to cost more. Because if supply goes down, costs go up. Ooh, and worse than that, China announced last week, but you already know this if you follow my Twitter account, DRTCJ, who tweeted that out this morning? Anybody? Got one person that we're going to tweet it out. That's China announced last week, they're going to do a review and decide whether they <laughs> decrease treasury purchases or eliminate them. If your largest buyer of treasuries walks out in the market and you just cut, cut currency, what happens to prices? They go up dramatically, and we're going to see that. Rising interest rates are going to be the result. Midterm elections, I'll talk about that in a second. Cheap energy drives the U.S. economy. And I actually see three decades or four decades of this. Y'all get me on this one yet? I'd like to see if we can have a hiccup with this other thing. Here's my forecast. Housing sales up 2% this year. These are national numbers. Uh, existing home prices up 3.6%. You did more than double that. You did double that, essentially. New home sales up 9.2%. Builders, you think I'm right? If you can get lasers, am I correct about that? Yeah, big issue on that one. Oh, and for my builders, new home prices up 4.1%. And by the way, that doesn't mean that new home prices go up. It means their cost went up more than that. If y'all want to take someone out to lunch this next week, take a builder. Their, their framing timber costs last year went up almost 14%. But you'd know that if you tweeted with me already. <laughs> 
refinance volume for my lenders can go down 25 to 35%, and only because of rising interest rates. The most, well, commercial real estate sales I see down 15%. I don't see that as much here because you're still one of those attractive places with job growth and cheap real estate. You're cheap compared to Miami and New York and Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles. Who agrees? Commercial people say amen. No one said amen, what the hell? <laughs> Most talked about news media this coming year, this year is gonna be about the midterm elections. I have had enough. Anyone else had enough of that already? I have a Twitter account, have I mentioned that yet? <laughs> PRTCJ. So you gotta love this one. Every year, oh, when I speak at it, Bankers Associations and American Land Title and National Association of Local Convention, the thing I heard about this year was artificial intelligence. Once again, I'm going to concur with Kitty. I don't see AI replacing anything that we, you and I do because you're in real estate. If you're making widgets or hubcaps, yeah, you have a computer and a robot do that. It's not going to replace anyone in this room. That, the reason about that is, is any piece of real estate identical, yes or no? no. Say no real loud. No. no. Yeah. Is, is the motive of the buyer and seller identical ever? No. no. For my lenders, tell me about the credit quality of your borrowers. Identical? No. So artificial intelligence. Y'all remember Roger Federer, kind of a really cool tennis player? Here's his take on artificial intelligence. Here we go. Welcome home, Roger. You want that fresh cup made exactly like you wanted, am I correct? The same was true with real estate, so I'm not worried, even though Elon Musk says that AI is gonna destroy all of our jobs, not in this industry. Who agrees with me? Can we even tell the people we're in? Yeah, sorry, I think it's different. Every year I look for my favorite sign out there, it's my favorite sign of the past year. <laughs> What's grow my own food, but I can't find bacon seeds. <laughs> I grew up on a farm and ranch, I'm still looking for the bacon seeds. And then I look at the stupidest thing I ever saw. Guess what it was? Yeah. By the way, it was in California. Diet ice. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Be aware of the Californians coming in, because they're weird. You know, talk. Who's, who's from California in here? Anybody? Shoot. Go to Colorado and half the people are from there. And there go from there. By the numbers. Do we get questions or just have to shut up? I was going to answer them. Yes. Ten thirty one exchange is about the new tax law, and the answer is nothing was changed. Originally, on the cutting block was going to be ten thirty ones. Commercial real estate came out almost completely unscathed, unless you're a REIT. And a REIT, if they have more than twenty five million dollars of income, adjusted gross income, then they start to lose some of their ability to deduct interest. What have you? Commercial real estate was the biggest winner in the tax act. Good, good question, by the way. Next question. Yes. If interest rates go up 100 basis points, we already have money in our pockets to pay for it because the tax cut. I don't think it's doing anything to us. So I've actually seen 70 to 130 basis points increase. I'm the highest in the country on 130 basis points. Everyone except my good friend Doug Duncan, his chief economist at Fannie Mae. We got our PhDs together, so we kind of kid in spirits. Doug's at 4.1 percent of the C rates going up. I see him going up, but even at 4.7 percent. I built my first house. In, uh, it closed in November of 1989. I was a professor at Texas A&M. I got a 30-year fixed rate loan at nine three quarters percent, and I was thrilled. So first time in over a decade, it was below 10 percent. 
I think rates are inordinately cheap right now, and I think you ought to buy as much as you can right now and borrow as much as you can. Lenders, am I correct about this? Yeah. yeah. Good question. And you had a question. You had a question up here. What's that? Oh, cryptocurrency. Typically, that's my first question. Let me tell you about cryptocurrency. Good idea. Brilliant theory. But for anyone who's in retail, if you sell stuff and you sell like a hundred bucks, three to five bucks goes to credit card company. You get ninety-five to ninety-seven bucks. So the ideal between blockchain, all blockchain is, is a, a computer ledger that people can come in and out of. Now the word crypto becomes comes in the name encrypted currency. And, and remember, it's not real currency, it's just whatever you believe in. We used to believe in gold, we used to believe in silver, we used to believe in, I believe in beer trading. If you've been to Florida back in the days when you couldn't buy cars there, you could make a lot of money taking it there. Just talk to me about my college days sometime, we'll talk about that. But what happened was, you're a spy and I'm a spy. I'm quick, it goes to you, comes back to me, no one else can see what's in, and so we're doing the right thing. That's what a cryptocurrency is. Now let's go back and think about this thing. If you can do the cryptocurrency completely costlessly, it's brilliant. You're gonna save my merchant three to five percent. Ooh, anyone own Bitcoin in here? One of my really good friends at Christmas bought a cup of coffee at the gallery at a place that took Bitcoin. Five dollars for the coffee, 20 bucks for the transaction cost. <laughs> kind of lost that right there. Why did we do that? Because just to run Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, we use 42 terabytes of electricity a year. That's as much as New Zealand uses the entire year for the entire country. And they have a balloon smelter there, which is all electricity. Guys. All right, all right, so let's talk about this. Go back to originally. Let's talk about the interviews. It's a brilliant deal. Let's say this. Um, uh, we, we're the innovators. And we all get in the innovators. We can put currency back and forth to every country and avoid any taxes in the federal banking system. Brilliant, right? Ooh. Now all of a sudden, South Korea announced yesterday that they're going to start requiring all the cryptocurrencies to report the ownership of every account and the transactions. And South Korea said they expect this year to collect 24.2% 20, of their total corporate and income taxes from cryptocurrency countries, companies. Ooh. So I lose our comparative advantage. Do you all see this? Uh, and, and who remembers two of Mania? Two of Mania was amazing. In the 1600s, we, we, the royalty out of Europe sent explorers to Africa. One of them was the Holland. And these people from Holland, the reason Holland has all these tulips is their explorers found tulips in Africa. And they bring them back. And of course, the royalty got them because they funded the trips. So all of a sudden, the royalty has the prettiest flower beds in the world. Kind of a treat. And then the aristocracy said, we need tulips too. And then the common person said, we need tulips too. Kind of like Bitcoin started out with these tech people, and then the few other people got it, and everyone wants it. And the, the last year that uh, Tulip Mania ruled, a tulip bulb cost two years of a person's salary for a tulip bulb. This article I read a couple weeks ago said, you know, the amazing thing about the difference between Tulip Mania and cryptocurrency mania is at least under Tulip Mania, you have a really pretty garden when it crashed. <laughs> Oh, and I'll, I'll quote Warren Buffett. My, you know, I think he's a guru too. And uh, Warren Buffett said, there is no good outcome here. Because we're all in this. It's already down almost 50%. So you know, one of the things I said today, read today was that we go down about $2,000 in Bitcoin. You go from $19,000 to $2,000, that's devastating. That is. Like, if you're a seller, it's great. If you're a buyer, it sucks. Leave that. Good question, by the way. Yes? Say it really loud. Oh, skill trade shortage. Thank you that you asked that, and Kenny's part of this thing. Let me tell you about where BMW went in South Carolina. Why did they pick South Carolina? Because the local community said this. They said to BMW, we will give you a security bond on your plant if we can't provide the workers with the associated skill sets to that, we will pay for your factory. Oh, and BMW said, we're coming here. And then the local community decided we're going to invest in the future and they passed all these taxes to have all these skill sets necessary for painters and welders and manufacturers and machinists and everything else like that. And when BMW walked in there, they had this massive 
crowd of skilled people to employ. How about that? We just shipped last year more BMWs from South Carolina than any plant BMW has ever owned any place in the world. All because of skill sets. And by the way, they have to be marketable skill sets. College is not for everyone. Who agrees? If you have an English major, good luck. That's all I'm going to say to y'all right now. <laughs> One more, two more questions? Yes, David. Infrastructure issues. Oh, infrastructure issues. It's tax. We are behind the curve on infrastructure. And I actually think that the next thing we're going to come out of Congress after we figure that this, uh, this debacle we're looking at right now about raising the debt ceiling, what have you, we have to invest in the future of the country. Who agrees? That's everything from dams to roads to hospitals to airports. We've been pretty good about airports. It's kind of intriguing. But we really need to double down and invest because it will keep us globally competitive. You agree with that, Kenny? He does bubble head on that one, too. Yes? Many year election is going to suck. <laughs> if you're a Republican or Democrat, it's going to suck. Who agrees? I already told you I had enough. You had to ask me who's going to win? The hell, I had a clue. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not a politician guy. I'm not a political guy. I vote for both parties. I think there's leadership on both sides. Who agrees with me on this? If you just go in and punch the party ballot, I think you're missing some really good leaders on both parties. I will tell you that up front. Now, I am physically conservative, so you can guess where I lean. But you probably already knew that. Uh, no, I live in Jackson. You couldn't possess it without doing that. <laughs> yes? Did you say, if, uh, if I'm here next year, like I'm not going to be invited back? <laughs> Crap. So if I'm here next year, yes, go on. If you're here next year, and if the case was that one event or one incident totally wrecked your prediction, what do you think that Great, great question. As an economist, he asked, what one event could cause my predictions to be wrong? As an economist, it's really easy to forecast trends. They just keep going. I actually think you're going to sell more homes this year than you did last year, assuming y'all can get listings. I think that builders going to have the best year in 10 years. Builders, you kind of agree with me on this one? I think employment growth goes up. But we look at 9-11. In 9-11, it's an event you could not forecast, at least many of us could. I could. Uh, NOCO, North Korea, kind of loose cannon. Who agrees with me on this one? Um, Sheep. Um, yeah, I don't know. If interest rates went to 10%, golly knows why, I think we would have a different economy. So uh, I'm going to tell you it's going to be an event that will happen that we don't know of right now. Right now, the trends are going to track as they did. One last question I have to go out of here because we feel it's going to have a beer afterwards. Yes? How safe is the stock market? So my friend Ted Cruz, he's sitting there next to me in, in Sunday school. He's also a beer drinking buddy. He doesn't drink much beer. I drink all of this. It's okay. <laughs> he said, what can we do to mess up this economy? I said, if you don't grandfather in the mortgage interest deduction, you can hurt some people. He said, great. And, uh, and he said, what's next? I said, if you don't provide the corporate income tax cut, then we will take the stock market so bad it will burn a hole through the middle of the earth because that was already priced into it part of it. Now, if we hadn't done the corporate tax cut, I would tell you I'm extremely worried about the valuations. But if you look at the increased tax flow, cash flow, to every corporation, most, most every corporation in America, we are so much better off right now, I'm not too worried about it. Does that make sense? It's all about the corporate tax cut. And to me, that's the reason I'm really optimistic about the future right now, guys. I'll tell you that up front. And I'll thank you all enough to be back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.